All right, good day to you. Welcome to Village Church. If you are new, a special welcome to you. Uh, my name is Mark. I'm the senior pastor here. Hello to all the sites, uh, Surrey, Langley North, Langley South, and Calgary. We're really excited uh, launching uh, Coquitlam as well uh, very soon. And so good to be. We are one church. Uh, we meet in different places, but we are one church. And we are uh, exploring the master class of life. So if you've got a Bible, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4 is where we will be. And uh, before we get there, I want to announce a really special thing. Um, over the last three or four years, we've done golf tournaments tournaments here as a church uh, every summer to be able to raise money to send out into the global mission scene. We've always been a church that hasn't really been about just kind of hanging out in the cities that we belong to, but how do we actually help the global scene, the poor, the widows, the orphans? And, uh, and this year, we're really excited to be partnering with a ministry called Kawasha out of Uganda, Africa. It's an amazing ministry that really uh, hones in uh, Uganda. This particular part of it is the epicenter of HIV AIDS. You have generations that are totally gone. My family and I are actually going there in a couple of weeks. My family has gone without me for a couple of years and just this amazing ministry has captured our hearts and the hearts of many people uh, in our church and the work that they do, uh, do, having a clinic and doing a school, changing generations. Uh, it's honestly amazing work. And they see about 16,000 people through a clinic every year. Uh, we actually support a bunch of kids as a family and you go there and you see that they literally have parents. The one girl that we uh, support, her name is Natasha. She's six years old. She walks two hours to school every day to the school that Kawasha does. Uh, she literally walks an hour and a half to get water. This is still a thing. We kind of forget it. And both of her parents, her father passed away of AIDS a few years ago when my wife was there, became good friends with her mother. And, uh, and then my wife was there last March. And then went, by the time she came back a few months later, later, uh, her mother passed away as well. So here's little Natasha living with her grandmother. You have an entire generations wiped out through HIV, AIDS, through malaria, uh, terrible things in this particular part. And yet you have this bastion of light, this ministry that's serving uh, so many of these people, literally thousands and thousands of people, uh, tons and tons of kids. And uh, they take about 1,500 students. And when those students get supported, their whole family gets supported by way of healthcare and so on. And so we have a big vision. They have about one $1.3 million worth of improvements that they need to make. They've been doing ministry for about 30 years. And I was talking to the director the other day and he was saying uh, literally most things are falling apart and they would need about $1.3 million to be able to get them the next 30 or 40 years in regard to the clinic, the school, the things that they're doing. So we're going to do that. A million dollars in a single day, we're going to raise through the golf tournament and send on toward Uganda. Uh, so we're really excited about it. Uh, August 28th, 2019. Make sure you put it in your calendar. Uh, there's different ways that you can help. You can. The big thing that we need right now, and it's going to be at all the lobbies and all the foyers of all of our sites, is sponsorships. So if you have the businesses uh, that you can get into sponsorships to be able to sponsor a whole, promote something, and you get your four golfers, uh, we're going to have a gala after. It's going to be amazing. We're even going to amp it up in regard to quality from past years. Uh, we're just going to make it class. It's just going to be, the, the food's going to be unreal. We have five amazing chefs that we've got everybody from. David George was the master chef of Canada a few years ago. We have these five chefs lined up that are going to do family style. It's going to be unbelievable, an unbelievable night. Uh, and so get your sponsorships in. That's the big thing is we need you to go, okay, I have uh, some kind of business or my friend does where we can sponsor a hole. Holes are more expensive than we've had in previous years because we're trying to raise twice the amount of money. So, you know, don't bother sending the emails that are like, well, last year we only paid this for a hole, but this year it's this. It's like, I know we're trying to raise raise twice the money. It's math, right? So, uh, so we want you to be able to support a whole, be super generous. Uh, and then the second thing is, is um, uh, be able to give us those auction items. So we want, we make a lot of money off auction items, so, but not so much like, like here's a, you know, the, we, we like experiences. So if you have that home in Hawaii or the desert or some, you know, somebody famous like Tiger Woods or somebody, probably less famous, uh, 
get us that so we can auction that off. That's a huge money. We make a great margin um, uh, on those kind of items. Let's people say, I want that kind of experience. So bring, uh, go online, thisisvillagechurch.com slash golf or text the word golf to whatever your site happens to be, the number. And, uh, and we want to get uh, those auction items and you signed up, uh, those businesses signed up. They will go quickly. We've done a few um, dinners with people who've, put, uh, who've been involved in the past and they've shown a lot of interest already. And they're saying, hey, we want our business to be here. So make sure that you do it uh, because the spots will go quickly. We're very excited about it. August 28th, it's going to be amazing. Okay, now, uh, 1 Corinthians Masterclass, chapter four. Last week, we had an encouraging sermon where I told you I don't know that I actually even know a Christian. All right, now, that was part one. This is part two of that same kind of sermon, okay? So uh, 1 Corinthians chapter four, verse 13, Paul starts to kind of lay out this idea. And the reason he's doing it, he's really trying to knock out the knees from us and tell us, listen, some of you guys, I'm gonna list a whole bunch of things that none of you are. And I'm gonna talk about who I am. And that's what he does as an apostle. He says, you guys, there's two kinds of people in the world, he says. There's the people who are up sitting with Caesar and they're watching people suffer and they're watching people get beaten to death in the lion's den, in the arena, and they're up there cheering with Caesar in the comfort and the pleasure of their own house. They have comfort, they have great square footage, their life is good, they have a great reputation, great jobs, they're powerful, they're honored, they're great people, they're good looking, they're strong. And then there's a group of people who are in the arena getting beaten on and sacrificing for the good of the world. And the Apostle Paul says, that's me, I'm in the arena, I'm on the edge, I, I'm, I'm of disrepute, I have no honor. I'm gonna show you that list in a sec. I'm that, and then there's the group that's okay, and you have to make a choice which group you are. And the reason he does all of this, it's not to discourage people, it's basically to say, listen, we all have to be humble enough, because what we begin to think about in our life is that we've made it in the world, we're worthy, we're good, and so God's gonna bless us because we're good, and he's trying to, remember he said in verse 10, 11, 12, he said you become puffed up. And so this whole text is about trying to get you deflated, all right? It's trying to take away your puffiness. It's trying, now, here's why. Because it derails your life if you are the center of your own story and you try to live life in your own power, it's going to be bad for you in the end. And here's what I mean. Last night I was putting my three, I have three daughters for those of you who are new. I was putting them to bed last night and our youngest daughter, uh, who's seven years old, has this little uh, stuffy, all right? That Now, I don't know, for those of you with kids, you start down the stuffy train and it's a complete gong show, all right? You, you, you give them one stuffy and then they get attached to it and then that stuffy becomes your whole life. And then you, everywhere you travel, where's the stuffy? Where's the stuffy? And there's more stuffies. And every time you're out, there's another stuffy. And it brings her so much joy. I can barely get into her bedroom because of all the stuffies. It's just like, okay, I gotta get into it. There's stuff everywhere in regard to these little tiny stuffies. But there's one she got when she was first born. It's a little pink and white and she sucks on its little ears since she was a little kid. And it's gone, every, it's gone on every trip. It's gone on everything. And unbeknownst to me, three days ago, she lost it. And she's held on to it. I mean, it's impressive that she still has it after almost eight years. Um, and so, what does she do? Last night, I'm putting them all to bed. Okay, everybody, gather around. Yes, Father. And we're all sitting around, and I'm praying with them, and I pray, and they said, and, she, and she, Bella was crying. I'm like, what's wrong? She's like, I lost my stuffy. I'm like, you lost your stuffy? I can't believe this. You've lost stuffy. Okay, and I prayed. I said, Father, help us find stuffy. We've lost stuffy the last year. I, I know there's other things going on in the world. Just take it easy, all right? Help us find stuffy. We're missing puppy, puppy, stuffy, whatever. Hey, please, Lord, show us your power. Show us your real, you know, let's find it. Anyways, so, hey, kiss them all. Put my oldest to bed. She gets into bed. I go back, and my wife says, oh, here's stuffy, all right? Three minutes later, oh, here's puppy. And oh, my goodness, and Bella's like, da, 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 da. she goes, and I go into my oldest and <clears throat> crawl into her bed, pray for her, give her a little kiss, okay? I'm going to bed and I said, wasn't that amazing? We found stuffy. See, we prayed and then God answered prayer. We found stuffy. That proves that God exists. And, and my 12 year old looks and goes, so you're telling me if he didn't answer our prayers, that means he doesn't exist? And I'm like, what? And then I just ran away, all right? Cause she just philosophically outplayed me, all right? And so, 
Because here's the thing. Here's how we begin to think. We begin to think that if God answers my prayers exactly how I want him to, uh, then he exists and he's good. But if he doesn't answer my prayers the way I wanted him to, then he doesn't exist or he's not good. That's the kind of puffiness, that's the kind of derailment that the Apostle Paul is trying to save everybody from, which is why he starts to say, guys, listen, you want to understand who you are? Get down away from Caesar and the pleasure and the power structures and come down into the arena. And he says this, I am willing to be, he says, we are fools for Christ, meaning the world is going to look at you and they're beginning to think things of you. He actually gives this long list. He says, we're fools. We're weak, right? Uh, you are held in honor, but we in disrepute. And he starts giving this long list of stuff. And he starts saying, this is me. I'm an apostle. <clears throat> to the present hour, we hunger and thirst. Think about this in our life. We are poorly dressed. What? He's, he's pausing, he's saying, here's people up there, and here's me. We're buffeted, we're homeless, we labor, we're working with our own hands, we're reviled, we're persecuted. Think about your life and begin to say to yourself, is this actually you? Which one of these sides are you? And so he begins to say, okay, what are you? Are you a fool or does everyone respect you? Does everyone look at your life and say another? And he's saying, there's a downward mobility that has to happen in your life. You have to start looking at this list and wonder to yourself, why isn't my life like this? Why isn't my life like the apostle? Why am I probably someone that fits more up to the people who are sitting up in the stands watching other people do less and everything's fine in my life because you've sought after comfort. You've sought after ease. You've sought after pleasure. You've sought after the good things in life so much so that none of these things actually reflect you. And that's the question we begin to ask. How is it that we're going to actually do downward mobility? Why would we want to go downward instead of upward? Here's two reasons. First, because God looks good in the world when you have downward mobility and yet you have pure satisfaction in your life. That's when God looks good. That's when God is most, as one writer has said, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him, not in the midst of prosperity, but in the midst of loss, in the midst of pain. Here's what I mean. Um, when you drive an amazing car and you're happy, the world doesn't necessarily think the equation is that person must be happy because they have Jesus in their life. Right now, I'm not telling you you can't drive an amazing car. I'm telling you, most people aren't going to say your happiness, your contentment, your joy is directly connected to the God of the universe because they see something else. They see this material thing. They see this beautiful, shiny thing, and they equate some of your joy and happiness in life to that. That's just how it is. I'm not critiquing it one way or the other. I'm just saying that's how it is. I was sitting with a, with a leader uh, of, of, of a global mission movement, and he was saying he was in China a few weeks ago, and he's sitting with these uh, home church pastors in China, which is all they have. They've nationalized their buildings. They've killed their leaders. They've put them in prison. Christianity becomes outlawed. And then you begin to see these people that have nothing, and yet there are miracles. People are coming to Jesus. People are being healed. There's joy. There's contentment. There's the gospel going forward. There's people coming to Christ faster than any time in the history of the world, in any nation. And, and when you're thinking about that, you kind of very much easier say to yourself, well, the reason that that's happening is because there's a move of God. When I go to Uganda in a couple weeks and I go in, you're going to see these kids who just walk two hours to school and they have nothing, but they're happy and they're joyous and they're dancing. And, we're, and we give them little stickers and they stick them on their face and they walk around and they're, they're living these beautiful lives. You don't tend to go there and go, you know, you know, I think the reason they're doing that is because they have so much. But if you see a kid in the modern world and he's sitting on his iPad and he's smiling, you might go, I think that kid is happy because his iPad. You're not going to necessarily say, I think that kid's happy because he's got the joy of Jesus in his life. I'm not criticizing the things that we have. I'm just saying that's just naturally how it is. And so why would you go after downward mobility? Because God looks better. He looks good. He looks all satisfying. When you are satisfied in him, the world feels that in a way that it doesn't feel it when you don't look like this. 
When you have everything together, you are honored, you are powerful, you have status, you are good looking, you have prosperity, you have pure pleasure and delight. Because here's what happens. You take that message out into the world and they say, did Jesus give you that? Well, I'll take Jesus then. And the gospel is diminished. This is why, uh, if you got a Bible, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul wrote a second letter to these guys where he wanted to exemplify what he was talking about. And listen to his list of his life. These are all wonderful things that we seek after in our lives. He says this, hey, you guys want to be like me? You guys want to follow Jesus? Here's what it looks like. Five times, he says in chapter 11, verse 24 of 2 Corinthians, I received at the hands of the Jews 40 lashes less one. Three times, I just said two, but I meant three. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Not like the good way. All right, not like I smoked a joint one time and I didn't like it. He was stoned to death. That's what happened. You get stoned, you don't like, guys don't stone you and then just go, I think he's okay, now let's walk away. He was stoned to death. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers in toil and hardship. Through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure, and apart from other things, there is this daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches who is weak I am not weak, who is made to fall, and I am not indignant. If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. That's his point. This is all backwards. You don't walk into a job description, uh, into a job uh, interview, and they look at you, and they go, tell us why you should hire. You don't tend to go, ah, show up late three out of five days. Is that okay? You don't do that. But he goes, if I'm going to boast in anything, I'm going to boast in a weakness, because that's what's going to make God look good. And so here's... First thing, why would you go after downward mobility? Because God looked good. Here's the second reason, because it's good for you. And here's why it's good for you. Psychology tells us, modern psychology tells us, that there's no such thing as an unmitigated good. So you go after pleasure, comfort, your dreams, your desires, prosperity. You go after all those things. And those things are great. But the problem is, if you go after them, there does come a point, and every psychologist in the world, you can just pick your issue, looks and says, there comes a point where something is really good in life, okay? So you're going along and it's a good and you're pining after it, money, pleasure, pain, or not pain, uh, good things, good things, a great marriage, and then it peaks and the return on investment starts to plateau, and then if you get more and more and more of it, what starts to happen is there is a decline. That's the way everything, are. So, so for instance, okay, take, um, uh, take uh, uh, smartphones. Right? Smartphones introduced to the world eight, nine years ago. We love them. Do your apps, do your stuff. It's great, you can text, you can build community, you can get friends, you can do all this, great, awesome. The problem is, with that benefit comes the rise of what? All psychologists are telling us the rise of suicide, the rise of isolation, the rise of depression, the rise of the fear of missing out. All of these things are psychologically what's going on in the negative. There, there's a great positive to the things of social media, uh, community building, spread the gospel, use it for death. But then the return on investment plateaus, and then you get too much of it, and it starts to decline. Pick your issue. Uh, class size. All right, psychologists have done this on, on a, a flurry of issues. All right, you have like uh, your y-axis here and your x-axis here. So you have um, you have class size. Well, there's a certain class size that's a good thing, and so you start to go up and up and up, and you hit. And there's all kinds of debate about what the best class size is. Uh, but then you get too many kids, and it starts to decline. But it also goes the other way. If you don't have enough kids, it starts to decline too, because there's not enough social interaction. Um, Take uh, wine, all right, for those of you. So, 
Okay, some of you just woke up. All right, so, uh, okay, so uh, there was a study done on, on how wine affects and, and what the connection of wine to your health is. And so what they said, uh, if, and, and some of you will enjoy this, uh, they said there's a certain amount of glasses of wine per week that are actually kind of good for your health. And so they started tracking it. Well, what was it? This was a study done. You can read this in Malcolm Gladwell's book, uh, David and Goliath. And so they said, okay, is it one glass of wine? That's, you know, that's okay for you. Two glasses of wine, it's good. Three glasses, okay, it's good. We're talking about per week, not per day. All right, chill out. All right. Uh, six glasses, that's okay. You know, you're getting a one a day. Okay, it's good. And then they said about the ideal scenario is about seven glasses of wine per week and that's either neutral or it might be a little bit beneficial, all right? Uh, some of you are like, what kind of church is this? This is the craziest sermon I've ever heard. All right, so, so now we've hit here. We've hit this kind of moment where it's like a good, but then he says, once you go past seven a week, you start to go downward in its effect. And now you're at 11 glasses and now you're at 15 glasses per week and it starts to affect your money and your health and your family in different ways. And so there's, a, and you can apply this a hundred different ways, um, money. All right, your salary. There was a study that was done in America and it showed that there's an ideal salary and as it relates to the raising of your children, that obviously making, and this was, uh, these, these were American dollars, so don't try to translate them into Canadian in 2019 because it wouldn't make any sense, but this was done about uh, 10 years ago in middle America. Um, and, and what they found was that there was a correlation between a, a, a family's salary of income and how well they raised their kids because not having enough money sucks when you're trying to raise kids. It just does. You have to work more jobs. You're not around. And so if you made like 20,000 a year, it wasn't really good for your family. 30,000 a year, not really good for your family. But they said the ideal scenario in middle America a couple years ago was about $75,000 income into your home. If you had that, you could probably be there for your kids. Your kids would be okay. Da, da, da. But anything beyond that began to decline because your kids started to become spoiled. And so if you were making 300 a year, if you weren't careful, your kid was gonna start to feel entitled, live a life that wasn't very good. See, there's no such, my point is this, there's no such thing as an unmitigated good. There's no such thing that you can just take something that's good, stretch it out as far as it goes, go after more of it, and it's gonna be good for you. The reality is at some point, that good thing is gonna push back on you and be bad for you, and that's why Paul makes this list. He says, do not just go after unrelenting pleasure, unrelenting comfort, unrelenting square footage, unrelenting shiny things, because at some point, it will kick back against you. Come down into the arena and suffer more intentionally. Now, what does that mean for you? What are you gonna do? Take your clothes off, run around? Don't do that. What are you going to do? You are going to say to yourself this year, what does downward mobility look like for me? It may mean that I have, I have uh, isolated myself. I will not join a community group because me and my family are busy. We have our thing and we don't wanna submit ourselves to anybody else. Maybe downward mobility for you this year looks like you actually going, I gotta commit myself to another group of people. Maybe it looks like you gotta take more of your money and use it before, for generosity, for kingdom things. It might mean that relationship with people that's really difficult and tough that you lean into people that are hard to love versus surrounding yourself with everybody who you just get along with. You vote the same, you talk the same, you do the same jobs. You have to go, what does it look like to actually push myself a little bit instead of the comfortable world I've created? That's what the Apostle Paul is getting at. And he's saying, be very careful. He says this, you want a good analogy of what you should be doing? I'm trying to do, he says, what Jesus did. Scum of the world. Yeah, that's what we all want. That's what we want on our profile. Why would you like to work here? Because I'm the scum of the world. All right, great. I'm the refuse of all things. Talking about right now, he's basically describing the life of Jesus, the death of Jesus, and he's saying, this is literally my life. Now, so we need to do Daniel mobility because it's good for the world. <laughs> we need to do it because it's good for you. Now, here's the second way it's good for you, because... It's good for you. It's going to feel painful in the present, but the long term of it is good for you. And here's what I mean. Um, in the present world, you will get offered all the wonderful pleasures. We need to have the discipline to have the long game that trades out temporal things for eternal things. Think about 
the temptations of Jesus. When the devil came to Jesus and said, um, here's what I want you to do. I want you to jump off this temple because if you jump off this temple, I will give you all the kingdoms of the earth, he says. But then Jesus denies all of these easy ways, does downward mobility, moves forward in his life, suffers immensely, but then he gets raised from the dead. And at the end of the Gospel of Matthew, he uses the same word that the devil said, I will give you all the kingdoms of the earth. And he gets up in front of his disciples. And the last thing he says is, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, which means this. I was listening to one preacher, a guy named Dr. Eric Mason one time, and he says this, Jesus knew that the devil always presents to us on a temporal level something that God has promised to us on an eternal level. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. The devil wanted to give Jesus earthly kingdoms, but God wanted to give him all the kingdoms. That's exactly how it is for you and me. Don't settle for the, for the mud pies when you're being offered a holiday at sea. At sea, as Lewis once said, crosses now for later benefit. Even with Jesus, the book of Hebrews said, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. I know from your human motive, you're not motivated by great, it's gonna be good for the world. There's gotta be something in it for you. That's the way your soul works. So what's in it for you? Listen, you are gonna be far better off for the next 80 billion years if you have downward mobility and sacrifice as part of your life because you're gonna be rewarded for it, do not fend off the beautiful delights and pleasures of 80 million, 80 billion years for 80 years here on earth and say, I'm gonna build my pleasure now because you're not investing anything in the future. That's what, this is the point. You, you, you suffer a little now so that you can have benefit in the future. Think about uh, the people who go to uh, law, a doctor, a school to become a doctor. You gotta okay, take a kid who goes to school, he says, I'm here to become a doctor. He's got years where here's what he's gonna hear when he's sitting in his dorm. He's gonna hear the girls outside. He's gonna hear everybody getting hammered. He's gonna hear the, the pounding of the music. And he's gonna be sitting there going, I gotta study. I gotta study, I gotta study, I gotta sacrifice now. I know that girl's hot, yeah, I hear that music, yeah, I wanna go to that kegger, I wanna do it. I gotta study, I gotta study, I gotta study. And the guy who studies and doesn't go to the keggers and doesn't go out with a, he's going to become a doctor. Now, it's sacrifice for the, the, those seven years. I got buddies who went and did this, it's crazy. But fast forward seven years, where's the guy who every night went to the keggers and hung out with the ladies? He ain't a doctor. But this guy's now putting a lot of food on the table because of early sacrifice. That's how this works. Jesus goes, do not trade out the next 80 billion years because you found some pleasure. You have to be willing to do this. You have to be willing to become, what's the word he uses? Fools. You have to become fools. Now think about what it looks like to become a fool in the eyes of the world. That people around you at work or your neighbors or your family or your friends that might not know Jesus, who don't kind of come under, submit themselves under the scriptures as the narrative that's gonna define things for them. They just kind of go about life. Think about the things that you might believe or the things that you might do where they would look at you and say, you're a fool. Because Paul says, look, I don't mind being a fool. That's kind of what I'm called to do right here. We're called to be fools. Let me ask you a question. Does anyone in your life think you're a fool? Does anyone look at your beliefs, look at your life, look at the way you live and think that's foolish, that's stupid, that's dumb? If they don't, you might not be living out Christianity in front of them. That's the reality. So think about the things, the, the way the world functions. Take an issue. Uh, very hot topic this week, abortion, okay? Take the idea of abortion. Um, our culture has a particular view on abortion, the way it works and how, when, when life starts and so on and so forth. So, so much so that uh, our, our, this week, the New York uh, uh, legislature and the law courts passed a law where they could have really, really late-term abortions to the point where the Empire State Building, they lit up the spire in pink to celebrate this idea that you could abort a kid at like eight months or whatever it is, crazy. And so obviously as a Christian, we believe God stitches together in the womb and that's God's creation and that this is murder, so on and so forth. So you have this view. Now, uh, our Prime Minister, Prime Minister Trudeau, and don't worry, this is not a political point, so calm down. But he said this. He said, quite frankly, as a society, 
Um, uh, the, uh, the pro-life position, he said, is not in line with where we are as a government and quite frankly, where we are as a society. And so uh, the people who believe that this shouldn't happen and this is a life in there, they aren't in line with the Canadian government and they're not in line with Canadian society at large. So now they're fools. And so what you got to understand is in the scope of history, it's true that society might not align with all of your beliefs, but that's okay. Because listen, where, where, where society was at was vastly different than when the abolitionists came and tried to say slavery is wrong. Society was fine with slavery. When everybody wanted to push against civil rights, society and the government, they were fine with black people having different bathrooms and different schools and uh, functioning different buses, they were fine with it. Don't take your cues from the culture around you to understand what righteousness is. Righteousness might not be popular. That's not why it's right. Righteousness just needs to be right. It doesn't have to be popular. And you might be persecuted for the things that you believe. Are you willing or do you hide it? Well, I hide it, why? Because I want them to know about Jesus. No, it's because you're a coward. That's why you're afraid to talk to people about your belief. And take, I mean, take, take a million different issues, the personal work of Jesus, the exclusivity of Christ, and the fact that the Bible's real and we're trying to follow it. Jesus really rose from the dead. Take your whatever issue, he says, you become fools. Then he says, you become weak. Are you willing to be weak? It means this, you can't be the hero of your own story. You can't be the hero of your own life. You can't be the hero of your own family. Jesus is the hero and you have to be vulnerable. You have to give people these lists. I was beaten, I was stoned, I'm a disaster, I'm scared, I'm living in danger, but God is good in the midst of that because he looks good in my weakness, not because of my strength. Are you willing to be vulnerable? Are you willing to say to the people around you, I doubt, I doubt some stuff, I'm not sure. I'm not perfect, my marriage isn't perfect, my kids aren't perfect, my financial situation is not perfect, my beliefs aren't perfect, I have doubts, I'm not sure. Are you willing to be weak or are you always the man? Are you always the woman? It's like, I'm cool, I've gathered some people because I'm here to minister to you because you need me, false. That shows no weakness, you're always in charge. You're always in the power position. Your life's always perfect. You'll let other people, but you never break. You never let anybody in. Why? Well, I don't want them to, to see what's wrong with me. Don't you understand when they see what's wrong with you? That's when they, why do you think I, how do I preach half the time? It's just by telling you that I'm a gong show. Because what it says is God actually does some stuff, not because of that guy, but in spite of him. I'm surprised he even got here on time today. That's what most of you probably think. How has he actually been here on time every day? How is he wearing pants? I don't get it. How is he this functional? I'm not, my wife helps. <laughs> it's not because of, it's in spite of. So there's, a, there's an honor. Are you always held in honor? But he's saying we're in disrepute. He's giving this list because he's trying to say, again, part two, my gosh, if you wrote out this list on a T-chart, which side would you be on? Which is why I cried in my office last week and said to myself, I don't know that I actually know a Christian. When I look at this list and I wonder to myself what he's trying to do and what he's trying to say. Now, he moves on and he says this beautiful thing. I know I've been tough on you, all right? And Village Church, I know I've been tough on you for two straight weeks. So now he shows his heart, which is nice. For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many, look at this word, fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. I urge you then, be imitators of me. You know what he says? Um, you know why I'm being so hard on you? Because I'm like a dad to you. That is why I sent you Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach them everywhere in every church. Some are arrogant as though I were not coming to you. He's saying, when I started this church, I was like a dad to you. I actually love you. 
the reason I'm being so hard on you, he says, is because I love you. You're, you're like my beloved. You're like my children. And sometimes you don't, you're tough on your kids because your kids need it. It's not because, see, so in our house, we have this rule. Uh, and the rule is that we don't allow sleepovers. Okay. So, I mean, that's not for you. You can figure that out. But for our family, we don't allow sleepovers because when I grew up, that was where stuff went down. All right. Sleepovers are the reason I need freedom session. So the reality is my kids are like, sorry, there's no sleepovers. With internet and smartphones, all this, it's crazy. You're not having sleepovers. Your friends can come here. You're not having sleepovers. <clears throat> How do you think that goes over? Do you think my, my kids go, I'm, I'm so glad you just loved me with a fatherly love. Thank you for caring about my soul so much that you'll protect me. No, my kids... Why, Dad? Do you hate me? Yeah, I'm sure you hate me because you won't let me. And I hate you. All right? It doesn't go over well because all my friends are doing it. Now, do I do it because do I, am I hard on my kids because I want to be hard on my kids? No, I do it out of love. That's the point. That's what we do for people we love. Right? Sometimes tough words create soft people and soft words create hard people. If you come to church every week and it's dee 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 hello, I'm glad you're here. You're great. You look great. You are awesome. You are great. Then you're going to become hard people because you're going to really start to believe it and you're not. You're narcissistic. You're blind to your own imperfections. God is good. Jesus is the hero of your own story, not you, which is beautiful because then you get all the pressure off. So he's saying, I did it out of love. I'm doing these things out of love. I'm not doing these things because I'm angry. I'm not saying these things. Now, some of you wonder to yourself, why in these sermons when I come to church, why are they always so intense? Right? I was, I was, in a, uh, I was listening to someone, I actually got an email about a year ago. Someone said, I, I, can't, I can't come anymore. I said, why? And they said, every week is just like so intense. Everything's so intense. It's just like every, it's like every text is the most important. And every moment is just, yeah, 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 yeah. And I just, I just need to chill out a little bit. Like, I just want to come to church and chill. Now, I get that. The problem is, I care too much about you for that. Like, like I really do. Like, like a father, like I, like, like the urgency comes from the fact that I, that you are too precious for me to waste your time with nonsense. Why? Because of who you are. Now, who are you? What do you mean? Here's what C.S. Lewis said in his most famous sermon, The Weight of Glory. It is a serious thing to live in a society of possible gods and goddesses, to remember that the dullest and most uninteresting person you talk to may one day be a creature, which if you saw it now, you'd be strongly tempted to worship, someone who goes to heaven, or else a horror and a corruption, such as you now meet, if at all, only in a nightmare, someone who goes to hell. And he says, all day long, we are in some degree helping each other to one or other of these destinations. It is in light of these overwhelming possibilities. It is with the awe and circumspection proper to them that we should conduct all of our dealings with one another as human beings, all friendships, all loves, all play, all politics, because there are no ordinary people. You've never talked to a mere mortal. Nations, cultures, arts, civilizations, those are mortal, and their life to us is like the life of a gnat. But it is immortals whom we joke with people who are going to live forever. It is immortals who we work with. It is immortals who we marry. It is immortals who we snub and exploit. Immortal horrors or everlasting splendors. That's his point. It's fascinating. You are too precious for me to waste time. That's why Paul's saying, guys, like a dad to you. I mean, I look at my kids and I'm like, I'm trying to tell you hard things about life, not because I'm trying to be hard on you, even though you kick against me and even though you don't like me and even though you think I hate you, I'm doing it out of love so that you flourish. The world moves. You're welcome. 
All right, that's part one and two of a very simple idea. I'll stop there. Father, we are grateful that you are a good father in the midst of imperfections that we have, that we can show the world that there is a father who loves them and yet will discipline them when needed, but will call them to something great and beautiful and amazing and sometimes be tough on us and sometimes call us to actually give things up versus just going after the things of the world. And you do all of that, not so that we begrudgingly become Christians and aren't happy in the world and carry our crosses and bear them and are miserable. You call us to all that because it's what's good for us. And it's what's good for the people around us. And I pray as we landed last week, the same thing, that if all of this feels like stuff we've failed at and a burden that feels too much and we just feel like we've failed in these areas, that we would understand that that's why the gospel also rescues us. The fact that you died on a cross because we fail at these things, because we go after the things of the world, because we're up in the seats in the pleasure, in the comfort, unwilling to get down into the arena and get dirty and sacrifice and be of disrepute and be dishonored or terrified of it. And so you died because of that fear, but you rose again so that we might become those people and that that would actually change us to the core of our being. And that this year we would figure out how we could be more like this list than the other list in our life, that we would actually go home and figure out why aren't I like this and in what ways in my life in 2019 can I actually be more like this because it's good for the world, because it brings you glory and because it's good for us. That we'd actually believe that and it would change how we function in the world. Do that among us, give us the courage to actually live it out in Jesus' great name we pray, amen.